Let me start this video with a story. A man gets up for work, has a shower, has some breakfast, washes his teeth and walks to work. There's a deep hole in the road and he falls in that hole. And as he falls in, he says, help me, help me, I'm lost, help me, help me, it's dark in here. I'm lost, it's not my fault, it's not my fault, can anybody hear me? Eventually, somebody hears him. It takes forever to find a way out. The next day, the man gets up for work, has a shower, has some breakfast, washes his teeth and walks to work. There's a deep hole in the road. He pretends not to see it, so he falls in the hole again. As he falls in, he shouts, help me, help me, I'm lost, is anybody up there, can anybody hear me? I can't believe I'm in the same place, it isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. The next day, the man gets up for work, has a shower, has some breakfast, washes his teeth and walks to work. There's a deep hole in the road. He sees the hole, yet he still falls in. It's become a habit now. He knows where he is, he knows it's his fault, and he finds his way out of the hole. The next day, a man gets up for work, has a shower, has his breakfast, washes his teeth, and walks to work. There's a deep hole in the road, and he walks around it. The next day, a man gets up for work, has a shower, has some breakfast, washes his teeth and walks to work. And guess what? This time, he takes another street. Now that example is based on a poem by Portia Nelson. And it highlights that we are creatures of patterns and habits. And as I mentioned in the earlier video, it's our patterns in thinking and behavior that create our response to circumstances and not the circumstances themselves. So, have you ever used an alarm clock to get up in the morning? Well, the alarm clock is a trigger. What's the conditioned response? You immediately get up or, more likely, you hit the snooze button and grab another 10 minutes. What happens when you see a red traffic light? The red traffic light is a trigger. The response is that you stop. And then when the traffic light turns to green, that's another trigger that communicates to you the response to go. And then what about if your stomach rumbles? Your stomach rumbling is a trigger and the response it creates in most people is to grab something to eat. What happens when you see the word sale? That's a trigger and the response in you is, I think I might get a bargain here. At work, do you have a meeting on the same day and the same time every week? What's the conditioned response when there's called a meeting in your organization? Is it great, an opportunity to share my creative ideas or more likely, oh no, not another meeting? So just consider what are the patterns and habits in your organization? And more importantly, what response do you trigger in others? So when other people see you, when they hear your name, when they hear you talk, when they think about you, if you're a trigger, what sort of response does it elicit in others? Oh no, kind of like okay, or oh yes. And of course I know which response I'd like to trigger in other people. Now the idea of conditioned response was actually developed by Ivan Pavlov. But he actually got the idea from an American medical doctor called Dr. Twitmer. And Dr. Twitmer submitted a paper to the American Medical Association called Stimulus Response. And it outlined the hammer to knee reflex. Now, you probably know already that when somebody taps you on the knee with a hammer, then you get a reflex action and your knee kicks up in the air. Now, what Dr. Twitmeyer found was that if he went to tap someone on the knee, even if he didn't actually touch them on the knee, but he told them he was going to tap them on the knee, then he would still get the knee-jerk reflex action. And this is what he wrote about and published to the American Medical Association, who basically were not very interested. That's when Ivan Pavlov picked up that there was something interesting there 
and he started experimenting initially with dogs, putting some steak in front of the dogs. And when the dogs started salivating, he'd ring a bell. And then he'd put more steak in front of them again. When they started salivating, he'd ring a bell. Now he did this over and over and over again until he found that just ringing the bell would make the dog salivate even though there was no steak there. So what this means is that the steak and the bell were equated as being the same and created the same response in the dogs. And in his research, he anchored the sound of the bell to when the dogs were hungry and would salivate. Now, it took behavioral psychologists all that time to realize that as human beings, we're also subject to conditioned response. Actually, a lot of intelligent marketing and branding done today depends on understanding human behavior. For example, I remember the Pepsi ads. They used to get people like Britney Spears or Michael Jackson to appear in their ads because what they noticed was that when people went to a Britney Spears or Michael Jackson concert, they'd get into a heightened state of excitement. And of course, they wanted people to feel that way about their products. So what they did was they got Britney Spears to perform, they filmed her in concert, and at the height of the experience, she would pick up a can or a bottle of Pepsi. Then that formed the basis of their media campaign. So it was played again and again and again through all the media. And that meant that when people saw Britney, they thought of Pepsi. And when they saw Pepsi, they'd think of Britney and those feelings of excitement will come up in them. So really what this means is a new product or service is bought by a consumer when their behavior towards the product is changed. So the question here now is, if you're subject to conditioned response and you also elicit certain triggers in other people, can you teach one of Pavlov's dogs a new trick? Can you change those conditioned responses? Well, this is where the field of neuroplasticity is opening up the possibilities to change. And neuroplasticity is what makes personal growth and development possible and refers to the brain's ability to restructure itself after training or practice. Now, in the next few videos, I'm going to highlight these 12 key patterns. And remember, if you can recognize any of these patterns in yourself, what this means is you can begin to clear them.